So, last time we started a review of a couple of uh, the most basic aspects of classical transmission line theory, talked about the total impedance that is present on a section of classical transmission line. This is defined as the total voltage divided by the total current. It can be expressed in terms of the characteristic impedance and a position dependent or otherwise known as local reflection coefficient. The reflection coefficient is defined as the ratio of these two complex voltage amplitudes, the amplitude of the voltage wave that is going backwards and the amplitude of the voltage wave that is going forwards. And there is a position dependent factor of e to the 2 gamma z. Recall that gamma is the complex propagation constant. We are able to take the first equation here and to solve it for the reflection coefficient in terms of the total impedance and the characteristic impedance. So we can go back and forth between these two. If we happen to know the impedance somewhere, we can use this to get the reflection coefficient. If we know the reflection coefficient at one position z, then we can move somewhere else on the line and get it at that new position z. At that new position, we can take the reflection coefficient, put it back in here, and get the impedance, the total impedance at that new position z. And so in that way, we can move down the line, uh, interchanging between reflection coefficient or total impedance as circumstances and what you know uh, at that point in the line uh, change. Just to say that we've mentioned it here, we're not going to do much with it. If we have a purely propagating wave on the transmission line, that is to say this propagation constant gamma is equal to a purely imaginary quantity J beta, then our voltage that is a function of position can be written as V0 plus e to the minus j beta z plus e0 minus e to the plus j beta z. Out of this can be factored the magnitude of v0 plus and the magnitude of e to the minus j beta z. That magnitude is 1. And Therefore, the thing inside the absolute value here becomes 1 from the first term plus, well, we're dividing the second term by the first, and that, by definition, is the reflection coefficient. And we could write this in particular in terms of the reflection coefficient at z equals 0 times e to the 2j beta z. This first term, the first factor, is a constant, and the expression inside the absolute value, well, that's going to oscillate between some minimum value and some maximum value. Under passive conditions, where the reflection coefficient is caused by a passive load, a load that has no gain in it, uh, is, is lossy or lossless, the reflection coefficient rho of 0 is going to have a magnitude that is less than or equal to 1. So as z changes, uh, the phase of this second term is going to change. And we're going to have, from 
0 to 1, which is this first term. And then to that, we are going to add this term, rho at 0, whatever that is, times this varying phase. And as the coordinate z increases, the phase of this complex number is going to increase. We're going to rotate around. And so our distance, our length of this 1 plus rho at 0 e to the 2j beta z, all in absolute value, is going to get smaller as this thing rotates over here until its smallest value is going to be the magnitude of, and we don't actually need the magnitude here, 1 minus the magnitude of rho at 0. That's the smallest these two numbers can add up to be. Or if the phasor, the complex uh, number represented by this shorter arrow, uh, has a, uh, is positive real, has a phase of 0 degrees, then this arrow is adding to that arrow. And we would have then, in that case, again, I don't need the outer absolute value here the largest possible value that quantity could have, which is 1 plus magnitude of rho of 0. So if I were to plot this magnitude of V of Z and normalize it by the magnitude of the forward traveling wave, I'm going to have something that looks like this. I'm going to have a maximum value of the voltage, again, normalized. And what's that going to be? That's going to be this 1 plus magnitude of rho of 0. This is going to be the minimum value. It will occur at some location. And again, if I normalize it to V0 plus, this is going to be 1 minus magnitude rho of 0. Well, the thing called the standing wave ratio, uh, or for emphasis sometimes the voltage standing wave ratio, abbreviated as SWR or VSWR, is defined to be this maximum value of the voltage magnitude divided by the minimum value, and that comes out from what we've gotten here to be 1 plus the magnitude of rho. Well, I put rho of 0 here, but the magnitude of rho doesn't change uh, for this propagating wave if z varies. So I can just put in here 1 pl uh, plus magnitude of rho in the numerator. And in the denominator, I have 1 minus the magnitude of rho. So this basically, this SWR, is another way of expressing how big the reflection coefficient is on the line, how big its magnitude is. It doesn't tell us anything about the phase of the reflection coefficient, which after all depends on where we are on the transmission line. So that's there for completeness, but as I say, we won't usually uh, do a whole lot with the VSWR in this course. Now, the information we have here is sufficient to analyze problems where we interconnect sections of transmission line which have a certain length, let's call that length D, and are characterized by a propagation constant and a characteristic impedance. And a very typical thing for us to do would be to connect a load impedance at one end and ask uh, what's going on at the other end. What is the input impedance I see? Or what is the reflection coefficient on the line? Things of that sort. And with the equations we have, uh, we are perfectly prepared to do that. but. Uh, very often you will find that you are repeating the same algebraic steps over and over if you appeal to 
these two equations in order to analyze a circuit. Uh, and if the circuit is more complicated than just this, the algebra gets a lot messier. So there is an alternative way of characterizing a transmission line that works in more general contexts and uh, allows you to do with a lot less algebra um, things that would ordinarily be rather complicated from an algebraic point of view. And uh, these are called the chain parameters. This is actually a special case of a set of parameters we're going to study in more detail in chapter two. But for now, we're going to apply it only to a uniform section of transmission line. And what uniform means is that the propagation constant gamma and the characteristic impedance ZC are not changing with position on the line. So what are we going to do? We're going to look at a section of transmission line. We're not going to worry about what's connected to either end. We can have anything connected to either end. It might be a generator, might be an impedance, might be both, might be a lot of other things connected. We don't care. At one end of the line, the left end as we'll draw it, we will identify that coordinate as z equals z1. This is the position coordinate z. And at this point, there is a voltage and there is a current. Likewise, at the other end of the line, we'll identify that position as Z2. And again, there is a voltage and there is a current. And once again, I'll emphasize that the direction, the reference direction for the current is always in the positive Z direction. That is by convention. The chain parameter description says that instead of describing, let's say, the voltage at those two ends of line in terms of the amplitude V0 plus of the forward going wave and the amplitude V0 minus of the backward going wave, it says, well, look, you couldn't go in the lab and measure those. There's no machine, there's no instrument that can measure V0 plus and V0 minus. If you've taken the lab course, you know that we have to sort of fool uh, the measurement system into getting the information about V0 plus and V0 minus. What we're more likely to be able to measure directly is the total voltage and the total current. So how can we express the behavior of this transmission line in terms of those things that are presumably uh, easier to measure. Well, what we want is a set of relationships like this. The chain parameters express the voltage at one end in terms of the voltage at the other end and the current at the other end. The voltage at the left at Z1 is equal to some number, some constant, times the voltage at the right side plus another constant times the current at the right side. And likewise, we express the current at the left side in terms of the voltage and current at the right side. These parameters, these constants, are labeled A, B, C, and D. And they are indicated as functions of the coordinate Z at the left side and at the right side. I am writing these uh, as script characters, A, B, C, and D. There is a script font that is being used in the notes so that we don't confuse them with other uses of those letters. So how are we going to get a representation like this? The detailed algebra is a little messy, but let's outline the steps. 
we know that we can write the voltage at any position along the line as V0 plus e to the minus gamma z plus V0 minus e to the plus gamma z. And we know that we can write the current in a similar way where we introduce the characteristic impedance as a factor and we change the algebraic sign of the second term. So total voltage and current are something we're likely to know or to measure, to be able to measure. So what we're going to do is to solve for these two constants, V0 plus and V0 minus, in terms of, well, in terms of, let's say, the voltage at Z2 and the current at Z2. After all, these are two equations. If I put Z2 as my value of Z, this is two equations. If I think of V at Z2 and I of Z2 as knowns, and V0 plus and V0 minus as my unknowns, this is just a two by two system of equations, two by two matrix equation if you prefer, and I can solve it for V0 plus and V0 minus. Having gotten those values, I insert them into the same expression, but now for the voltage at Z1 and the cur uh, current at Z1. So what are we going to have? We're going to have uh, voltage equals something in terms of V and I at Z2 plus something else in terms of V at I and C2. Um, these are expressed and go back into here. And if I rearrange the resulting equations, I will get this form here. So what does that set of chain parameters look like? They're actually surprisingly simple. A, for example, is equal to the hyperbolic cosine of gamma times Z2 minus Z1. Everybody hopefully knows what the hyperbolic cosine is. It is one half e to the plus gamma times that plus one half of e to the minus gamma times that. There's a special case where if I have a purely propagating mode such that gamma is equal to J beta, then this is just cosine of beta times Z2 minus Z1. In fact, all of these chain parameters are only going to depend on the distance between Z1 and Z2. In other words, only on the length of the transmission line. It doesn't matter what I label those two coordinates, only the length is important. The others are similarly fairly simple. B is Zc times hyperbolic sine of the same argument. And if I have a purely propagating mode, then the hyperbolic sine is replaced by J times the ordinary trigonometric sine function. So this becomes imaginary. And that's what you have to do for the special case of a lossless line propagating a mode. C is 1 over 
Zc times the hyperbolic sine, and D, finally, in this case, works out to be the same as A, although that's not always uh, the situation. It is here, and it's, once again, the hyperbolic cosine. This description allows us to not worry about what the internal description of this transmission line is. It allows us not to worry about the magnitudes of the forward and backward going voltages. Only the total voltage and current at the terminals, at the ends of the line, uh, are important. We're going to see in Chapter 2 that not just sections of transmission line, but uh, more general kinds of circuits that have two pairs of terminals like this does. Uh, these have certain properties that go along with them. We'll just mention two here because they're fairly simple and uh, can be quite useful in some applications. Uh, AD minus BC is equal to 1 doesn't matter. Propagation constant, characteristic impedance, length of line, doesn't matter. It's always equal to 1, and it's basically because of a trig identity. And, well, this set of equations gives us the voltage and current on the left in terms of the voltage and current on the right. Suppose I want it the other way around. Suppose I want the voltage and current at Z2 in terms of those at Z1. Well, then, I'm going to want the um, basically the result of uh, exchanging Z2 and Z1. So I want A of Z2 and Z1. That turns out to be equal to D of Z1 and Z2. Um, but, of course, they're already identical because they're both hyperbolic cosine. Um, but, again, this is a property that turns out to be more general. B acquires a minus sign, but is otherwise unchanged. And so on. There are two others that are mentioned in the notes. So, with these expressions and these properties that the chain parameters have, uh, we can do things that would normally be a lot more complicated to carry out in terms of algebra. So, for example, let's look at this situation right here. Let's suppose that this left-hand end of this loaded section of transmission line is at z equals zero, and the right-hand end where the load is connected is a load impedance ZL, that's at z equals d. And I would like to know what is the impedance looking into those two terminals. Well, first of all, what does it mean when we use that expression impedance looking into, well, if we could apply a particular current, let's say through a current generator, and that supplied current I of zero uh, into those terminals, there would result a voltage V at zero, and what we mean by the impedance that we see is it's V of zero over I of zero. Well, According to our chain parameter description, the voltage on the left can be expressed in terms of the voltage and current on the right. So we're going to have, well, that is A at 0 and D times the voltage at D plus B at 0 and D times the current at D divided by C times voltage plus D times current. Now, of course, at the load, this load impedance is equal to the ratio of V at D over I at D. 
So I could express, for example, V at D as ZL times I at D. Every term here now contains a factor I at D, which I can cancel out, and I would get A at 0 and D times Z at D, which I'll just write as ZL here, plus B at 0 and D, and again C, ZL plus D. And what do we get if we put these formulas in? We get a formula that should look quite familiar. Let's just put it down here. It's going to be Z sub C, a few steps of algebra to do this, times a fraction, ZL hyperbolic cosine of gamma D <coughs> plus ZC hyperbolic sine divided by a denominator where sine and cosine are interchanged. This is, of course, very well known. Sometimes we divide the top and bottom by the hyperbolic cosine to get an expression only involving the tangent. And again, if gamma equals j beta, then cosh becomes cosine of beta d, cinch becomes j sine of beta d, and again, that can be written in terms of the tangent. So this is a very well-known formula. We've kind of done a lot of the advanced work by setting up these chain parameters, but once we've done that, we get this well-known formula quite quickly. Another thing you can get with the chain parameters is perhaps not so familiar, and that is um, when we have a situation like this, there is, of course, a voltage at the input end and there's a voltage at the output end. Uh, there are some times when you would like to know um, what is that voltage at the load end, at the output end, or put another way, what is the ratio of load to input voltage, or put another way yet, what is the voltage gain? Well, again, I plug in what V at zero is in terms of voltage and current at the load. I plug in, and I think I will leave out the steps of the algebra. You can do those yourself. Have ZL divided by ZL cosh gamma D plus ZC cinch gamma D. And let's put in, for example, what it would be on a lossless line. We have ZL over ZL cosine beta D plus J ZC sine of beta D. That's really quick. Even if you do the couple steps of algebra that I left out, it's still very, very quick. And normally, when you're learning this as an undergraduate, if they do ask you to do something like this, you're basically having to do a fair amount of calculation. So we get this pretty much immediately. This makes a number of other tasks easier. For example, if instead of just a simple load at the end of the transmission line, let's suppose that I have two kinds of transmission line. There is a central section of line whose length is D, and characteristics of that central section are going to be labeled as a propagation constant I'll call gamma 2, characteristic impedance we'll call ZC2. To the left, the line is different gamma 1 and ZC1, and on the right, we'll also have 
this same external transmission line parameters indicated with a subscript one. Well, if we want, for example, if this is the position z equals zero, then one thing that is probably of some interest is what is the reflection coefficient on that left-hand section of line in this section where presumably we have an incident wave coming. It sees this junction of a finite length of line which is further terminated with a semi-infinite length of line. What are we going to do? Well, the standard way to do this would be to ask what is the input impedance looking into the terminals toward the right at the position z equals zero. Again, we would use the chain parameters and they would very quickly give us that z at zero is equal to, and again this should look like a fairly well-known formula, zc2, this characteristic impedance, times zc1, which is basically a load impedance here. I have a semi-infinite line and no generator on it, so I expect there to be a transmitted wave going to the right, but no reflected wave. There's nothing to reflect here, and there's also no generator. So this semi-infinite piece of line is the same as if I removed it and connected instead a load impedance equal to ZC1. So our formula over there applies, and this is ZC2 times tan hyperbolic gamma 2D divided by ZC1 tan hyperbolic gamma 2D plus ZC2. And again, there's just a few steps of algebra that you can fill in if you want to see how all this works. Our rho of zero, the reflection coefficient on that line, will be, now we're going to take everything to the right of these terminals, this finite section of line and that, and replace it all by just a single lumped impedance whose value is ZC0. Z, Z, pardon me, z at zero, not zc zero. That serves as the load for the transmission line on the left, and the reflection coefficient in that case follows from our basic formulas, z at zero minus zc one, because here is the line on which we are looking at the reflection coefficient, divided by the sum. If you plug this into here, there's some steps of algebra to do, but perhaps the cleanest way that you can express the result is this. And again, I am doing the general case here where the propagation constant gamma 2 can be complex. Denominator is a little bit messy, contains both hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. And there it is. Both characteristic impedances, as well as what's sometimes called the electrical length of the transmission line, the product of the propagation constant and the length. We could also ask about the transmission coefficient. Transmission coefficient, which we can denote tau, is going to be defined as, well, the ratio of the voltage that we observe here at the output terminals. And we don't want to divide that by the input voltage. We only want to divide it by the voltage associated with 
so-called incident wave, the wave that is coming toward this initial pair of terminals where the first junction occurs. Uh, so since this is transmission line one, instead of V0 plus, we'll call that V1 plus. So this is the definition of transmission coefficient, how much output voltage we get here, and this, by the way, is the uh, traveling wave to the right on that transmission line, uh, divided by the incident, not the total, but the incident voltage. Okay, well, we can write this as V at D over V at zero times V at zero over V1 plus. This ratio we know how to calculate from over there. This ratio, the second factor, is going to be, well, V at zero is going to be the sum of the forward and the backward wave amplitudes, and that's just going to be one plus rho, or if you like, rho at zero, which we've already calculated. So we have the first factor from over there. We have the second factor because we've already calculated rho at zero. When we put all that in, and you're either in this class because you love algebra or you're willing to tolerate it, uh, Presumably, it's getting to the toleration point after all this, but um, you can calculate the final expression for the uh, transmission coefficient, and you get this. Again, it involves the characteristic impedances, and the denominator is the same as it is over there for the reflection coefficient. And again, we have expressed this in the most general form where the line can be either propagating or it can be one of those unusual transmission lines we've encountered where there's attenuation depending on what the frequency might be. We can, of course, make these formulas apply to the case where gamma is equal to J beta, or more specifically, gamma 2 is equal to J beta 2. Cosine hyperbolic becomes just plain cosine of beta 2d. Sine hyperbolic, J sine of beta 2d. These expressions then become complex. Let's couple, couple, consider, rather, a couple of cases. You might consider the conventional situation, the ordinary classical transmission line. The formulas for rho and tau for this special case are given in the notes. I won't write them again here. But it's worthwhile to plot, let's say, the magnitude of rho as a function of the electrical length of this transmission line as a function of beta 2 times d. We find that at beta 2 d equal to 0, which basically says that either the frequency went to 0 or the length of this middle section went to 0, um, what do we have? Well, we can see from here that if d goes to 0, hyperbolic sine goes to 0, and the reflection coefficient goes to 0. As we increase the electrical length until the point where beta 2d is equal to pi over 2, our expression contains sines and cosines. The sines become equal to 1. The cosine becomes equal to 0. And we reach a maximum value. And if you look at the formula, we find that the maximum value is Zc2 squared minus Zc1 squared over 
ZC2 squared plus ZC1 squared. So the worst case, if you don't want reflection, um, is this. The reflections at, well, what's happening? I'm getting a reflection at this junction and a reflection at this junction, and I'm getting all kinds of multiple reflections between the two junctions that add up to give me this formula, they're all adding up, these reflections are in phase at this position, and they give me this maximum overall reflection coefficient. Notice that these impedances are squared. This is not the ordinary expression for reflection when you only have a single junction. If I further increase the electrical length, to beta 2d equal to pi, well, once again, the sine of beta 2d will go to zero, and I'll have no reflection. That is the case when the length of this middle section is exactly a half wavelength. And if you don't already know it, you know now that no matter what the impedance of this central section is, a half wavelength long transmission line will give you no reflection. It will transform the impedance seen here, which is ZC1, to exactly the same impedance here, and that, of course, will give you no reflection. Anywhere in between, you get whatever value you have here, and this process, of course, repeats. The transmission coefficient does the opposite. Transmission coefficient is at a maximum when beta 2d equals zero or pi, because, well, where else could the energy go? It's not being reflected. It must all be transmitted, although there will certainly be a phase shift. Now, on the other hand, if we look at the case that might apply to one of our unconventional transmission lines, transmission lines that had a cutoff, even though the line has no losses, it is possible for the waves on that transmission line to be purely attenuated. So in this case, our hyperbolic functions need to be retained. And I'm going to look specifically at the transmission coefficient here because it's got something worth examining. I'm going to assume that we have an ordinary transmission line with a real characteristic impedance for the two outside sections, but that the central section, because it is uh, supporting a, a cutoff wave, an attenuating wave, uh, we expect it, from the examples we looked at, to have a purely imaginary characteristic impedance, so call it JXC2. Our transmission coefficient works out to be twice JZC1XC2, so our numerator is imaginary. And our denominator looks like ZC1 squared minus XC2 squared hyperbolic sine. So we still have to have the hyperbolic functions. And then plus 2J ZC1 XC2 hyperbolic cosine. So even though the line is cut off, I have attenuating waves, there is some signal left by the time I reach this far end, and I will get a transmitted wave in the right-hand transmission line whose parameters have the subscript 1. There is some wave left because the length of that central section is not infinite. 
We have e to the minus alpha 2 times z. Yes, it is decaying exponentially, but it would take an infinite length to decay to zero. Now, Cinch and Kosh both grow exponentially as the argument increases, um, but at any finite length, d, uh, these things will not be infinite, and therefore the transmission coefficient will not go absolutely to zero. So what do we have here? We have something that, yes, it's going to reflect a bunch of the wave, but some of it will penetrate and come out the other end, attenuated, but still present. We have a, well, it's another filter, right? Our, our lengths of unconventional transmission line, uh, we looked at an example that was a high-pass filter. There are other kinds of unconventional line that serve as low-pass or band-pass or band-stop filters. Um, whatever the situation, if you're in a stop band of this filter, you're going to attenuate but not completely get rid of the signal. This phenomenon is often referred to as tunneling. The wave decays exponentially, but there's a certain amount of it left by the time you reach the output terminals. Okay, so this is just an example of something that you can do with this chain parameter apparatus. Questions before we go on? You're very quiet. Nobody wants to be a Hollywood star when it's being recorded, I guess. Um, okay. I yes? But you normally picture the, and I guess the loss of line, the wave, like propagating and I guess having like phase changes as you go down in E. Yep. But with gamma just equal to alpha, do you lose that? Do you just see like a constant phase? Do you think it's like that? Yes, uh, the, repeat the question here. Uh, when I have case B, when the propagation constant is purely real, uh, we do not see a phase change as we move along the Z coordinate, whereas with case A, we have E to the minus J beta Z, and the phase is changing as I move along. That is absolutely true. We get no phase change in this cutoff wave as we move down the line whatever phase effects we have are going to be caused by, well, where, where does phase come in here? This imaginary characteristic impedance has given, well, this J and that J came from here. They're the only things that give a phase to this transmission coefficient. The hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine are both real. So, only the characteristic impedance is imparting the, the change in the overall phase of this thing. Okay. So this is new probably for most of you and you just have to get used to, you know, build yourself a new intuition that, okay, when this happens, this is where the phase comes from. Okay. I promise that almost all of the first four chapters would not involve Maxwell's equations or fields at all. Here's the one exception to that. The um, utility of our theory of classical transmission lines described in terms of their network properties, their circuit properties, is not limited to actual transmission lines. We're going to see here in a moment that they provide a very good description, a way of describing propagation of plane waves in materials whose properties can change from one layer, from one region to another region. So let's look at a situation where we can have plane waves. And we'll draw sort of a model problem, but we're going to try and keep the uh, situation as, as general as is reasonable without making the mathematics absolutely horrible. All right, so we're going to look at 
a material which for z less than zero is homogeneous, which means it's uniform, it doesn't change with position, and has magnetic permeability mu and dielectric permittivity epsilon. And we will envision a plane wave that is incident at an angle theta with respect to the z-axis with respect to the direction that's normal to the plane z equals zero. And to start out with here, we are going to regard that this plane wave is polarized in the y direction. So what are my coordinates? My coordinates are x is going to go to the right. It's parallel to the plane z equals zero. Y is going to be coming out of the board, <coughs> also parallel to the surface, and X cross Y will point in the Z direction, which is downward, as I've shown it here. Well, it should not be at all a surprise that we expect to get a reflected wave. And if this lower region, z greater than zero, were homogeneous, we would also expect to get a transmitted wave. But I'm going to make this a little more general. I am going to allow the permittivity and the permeability to vary, at least with the z coordinate. We might imagine a stack of layers of different materials. Each of one had a different mu and an epsilon or even if we are clever in the manufacturing process, uh, some continuously varying material where mu and epsilon change smoothly as a function of z. We will not let mu and epsilon depend on either of the other coordinates, x or y. So we're going to make some assumptions. Already said mu and epsilon functions of z only. We're going to assume primarily that none of the fields depend on the y coordinate. So as I've shown it here, this wave is propagating in the xz plane. It has variation with x. It moves horizontally. Uh, it also has variation with z. But no matter what value of y I look at, the field is the same. That's, of course, physically very unrealistic because that says the field extends to plus and minus infinity in the y direction. It's a toy problem in that sense, but it contains a lot of important conceptual material that make it uh, a useful and important one to study. And uh, if this plane wave, if this field is the result of being in the far field of an antenna, uh, this is a, an, a, a good approximate description of what the field might look like. So incident wave here, reflected wave here, and something down here. Let's look at what Maxwell's equations tell us under the assumptions that we have made. Maxwell's equations, well, there are actually eight scalar equations involved. Write them down so that we remember. When I write a vector on the board, it's going to be a letter with an arrow on top to indicate it's a vector. It will be in a bold font in the notes. If we have an isotropic material, then Faraday's law says the curl of E is equal to minus j omega mu times h. We're again talking about time harmonic fields and phasers with no sources present, no current density. Ampere's law says that the curl of H is equal to J omega epsilon E. Uh, each of these vectors has three components, so each of these equations is equivalent to three scalar equations. Here's six, and I have two more equations, the so-called divergence equations, del dot b or del dot mu h is equal to zero, del dot d 
or del dot epsilon e is equal to zero, again, the second one in the absence of charge density. It turns out that these last two are actually redundant if the frequency is not equal to zero. And the reason for that is if I take the divergence, let's say, of this first equation, the divergence of a curl is always zero, no matter what you're taking the curl of. And then I'd get zero equals minus j omega divergence of mu h. If omega is not zero, I can cancel, and I get those last two equations. The only time you really need the divergence equations if, is if you're looking at a static field. So by putting an x through that, I don't mean that they're not true. I mean that we don't need them. So we will only look at these six scalar equations, but they're six pretty messy equations in general. But everywhere that these equations have a derivative with respect to y, I get to set that derivative equal to zero because I have assumed that my field is not going to depend upon y. That greatly simplifies these six scalar equations. As a matter of fact, let's write out the components. Now, there'll be six equations. I'm not going to write them all out. I'm going to write three of them to start out with. So one of the equations I get from Faraday's law is that the partial derivative of EY with respect to Z is equal to minus j omega mu times hx. There was another term in this component. It was partial of ez with respect to y, but that derivative is equal to 0. I have partial of e, uh, where do I write it here? I have partial of ey with respect to x. It's another component of Faraday's law is equal to minus j omega mu hz. Again, there's a y derivative also here, but that's been assumed to be 0. And finally, partial derivative of hx with respect to z minus partial derivative of hz with respect to x equals j omega epsilon ey. So these are three of the six scalar equations that result from the curls here. I only wrote these down because these three equations involve only three of the field components. They involve EY, which I showed schematically on the diagram there, and HX and HZ, and they don't involve any of the other field components. As a matter of fact, the three equations I didn't write down don't involve these three components at all. They, in fact, involve HY, EX, and EZ. So what's happened is that the assumption of no Y dependence has turned this set of six scalar equations into two separated, decoupled sets of three equations. I'm already ahead of the game. I've simplified how my analysis is, uh, is going to be able to go. All right, let's look at one more thing here. Let's look at our incident wave. Our incident wave is going to be proportional to, that is, it will contain a factor of, well, of course, we're already assuming e to the j omega t as part of our time harmonic assumption. But this incident plane wave is going to come from some angle. And that angle theta determines 
a factor that gives me the x dependence of the incident wave. As a matter of fact, that x dependence has to be k. What's k mean? k is the wave number that comes when you study plane waves. It is omega times the square root of this mu times this epsilon in the upper region there. It's kx equals k times the sine of this angle theta. So if theta is zero, if I have normal incidence, kx is zero. If theta approached 90 degrees, the sine of 90 degrees is one, kx would be k. It would have all of the spatial dependence here. In general, for arbitrary theta, it's somewhere in between. Now, what about the reflected wave? The reflected wave, let's write this here, EY reflected. Well, exactly how much reflected wave I get, if you recall, comes by applying boundary conditions. We go through all the details, and I'm not going to do that here. Applying the boundary conditions, let's say that tangential E, and EY is a tangential field here, must be continuous from one side of this boundary to the other. And it must be so at all points of that boundary, that is to say for all values of X. So if my incident electric field contains a factor of e to the minus j kx times x, the reflected wave had better contain that same factor. Otherwise, as I tried different positions x, this would get out of phase with that, and I couldn't match the boundary conditions the way I do at, let's say, x equals zero. Because my material properties don't depend on x, they cannot introduce any other x dependence in the reflected field, or let's now call this a transmitted field, EY trans transmitted. EY transmitted has also got to have only an e to the minus j k x x dependence on that coordinate. Any other dependence would mean that you could not match the boundary conditions at all values of x on that interface. This is a very powerful statement because if all of the fields have an x dependence that is only this, then the derivative with respect to x becomes equivalent to just multiplying by this constant, multiplying by minus jkx. Same thing down here. So, I've gotten one step further. I no longer have partial derivatives, really. The only derivative I have left is with respect to z. I could just think of this as an ordinary derivative because any derivative with respect to x became this algebraic multiple and derivatives with respect to y are zero. Two of the equations involve a derivative the third one does not. The third one is an algebraic relationship between EY and HZ. I can take this equation, solve it for HZ, and plug that into the third equation. I now have two equations. I have eliminated one of the fields, the HZ, 
and what is left is minus the partial of EY with respect to Z equals minus J omega mu HX and partial of HX with respect to Z is equal to J omega times epsilon minus kx squared, this is the result of the algebra that you do, divided by omega squared mu times ey. Two equations, two unknown fields, ey and hx, and if I solve these, I'll know ey and I can get hz if I want it. Well, at this point, those of you who are not at an extreme oblique angle here should be able to look at these and say, boy, those look kind of familiar. They're the telegrapher's equations translated into a different language. So we're traveling in a foreign country. We need a dictionary. And that dictionary will translate from plane wave land into transmission line land. For this, let's make the voltage equivalent to EY. If I do that, the current must be equivalent to minus HX. You do have to watch your plus and minus signs. Uh, the right-hand sides here involve J something. So our line parameters, let's say the series reactance per unit length, is going to turn into omega times mu, which we've allowed to be a function of Z. It can be different, at, actually this way, different values of Z. The second equation here is where the shunt susceptance per unit length would go. And it will become, it's a little more complicated because there's two terms here that came from this little procedure. I do have omega times epsilon, uh, but then I have minus kx squared divided by omega mu. Characteristic impedance. Well, to make that a little bit simpler, let's uh, make a little box here. I'm going to write this expression as omega times epsilon times cosine squared of an angle I'm going to call theta of z. Once I get down here, for example, if this were a uniform half space and I had a transmitted wave, ordinarily that transmitted wave travels at a different direction, at a refracted angle or a transmitted angle theta t. And if I have multiple layers, well, each layer is going to have its own angle at which the waves are propagating. So that angle in each of the layers, I'm going to call theta of z in that particular layer. And I will, it turns out, uh, I, I find that this quantity, when I write in that kx squared is k squared sine squared theta, this basically gives me cosine squared. The zc, which is going to be the square root of x over b, then becomes zeta of z divided by the cosine cosine of theta z. What's zeta? Zeta is the notation, zeta sub, zeta sub nothing, um, is my notation for the square root of mu over epsilon. Um, some texts use the Greek letter eta for this, which is this, an n with a long tail. Um, I have always preferred zeta because it's the Greek z and z is impedance. Okay, so. Anyway, zeta is the wave impedance of the material wherever you happen to be. So if you're in that lower half space, 
it can be different at different values of z. And finally, the propagation constant gamma, which is a function of z, turns out to be j omega square root of mu times epsilon times cosine of this angle. And there's your phrase book, there's your dictionary. It tells you that the equations that describe these kinds of plane waves, plane waves for which you have only one component of E, and that's in the y direction, and these other two components of H, they are described by exactly the same two equations as the telegrapher's equations for a transmission line, provided I make these variable replacements. Now, is that really something I get to do? Have we thought about all of the possible consequences? Well, the one thing that we have not explicitly looked at is what happens when I connect transmission lines together? In other words, what about boundary conditions? Well, when I connect the transmission lines together, what am I doing? I'm saying the voltage on this side has to be the same as the voltage on the other side. The current on this side has to be the same, Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws. Well, let's look at our dictionary. The voltage is EY. EY is a tangential electric field. Boundary condition for it is that it's continuous. Okay, hook the two transmission lines together. What about the current? The current becomes HX. HX, a horizontal tangential field component. Again, in the absence of electric surface current, which we don't have for dielectrics, it's got to be continuous, Kirchhoff's current law. So not only the differential equations, but the boundary conditions are exactly identical. If you can solve a transmission line equation, you can solve a plane wave problem by making these replacements. There is no need to repeat what is basically the same mathematics to get what is basically the same result. So if you look at your undergraduate fields texts, uh, you'll see that, okay, they went through and they did transmission lines and they got reflection coefficients and all that stuff. Uh, they basically repeat the same thing for transmission lines. Here's a quick way to get it without having to repeat all that derivation. This is very powerful and we'll be using similar ideas later on when we talk about dielectric waveguides. Let's do a quick example. We just have a couple of minutes, so I'll do just the initial part of the example and I think I will leave the rest of it to you. The classic textbook example of plane wave reflection and transmission in this polarization is that we have a medium, let's call it epsilon one, mu one, incident plane wave at an angle theta. We could call this theta one since we're in region one. We'll have a reflected plane wave also at an angle theta one and we'll have a transmitted plane wave at an angle theta two. We said that our kx, our e to the minus j kx times x, uh, that behavior had to be the same in both regions. So in the upper region, it is k1 sine theta. In the lower region, it is say sine theta one, I should say. In the lower region, it's K2 sine theta two. K1 and K2 are simply the wave numbers with the appropriate material parameters associated. The fact that the Kx has to be the same in both region gives us what's known as Snell's law. <coughs> 
given the incident angle theta 1, this allows us to find theta 2. Our equivalent transmission line circuit looks like this. We have a ZC1, ZC2. This is almost too easy now that we've set up the apparatus. The reflection coefficient, we'll call it rho sub TE, is going to be what? Well, I have a load impedance ZC2. I have the impedance of the incident line, which is ZC1. I plug this into the Babelfish and no reaction. That's terrible. Um, I plug this into the translator and I get, okay, that's good. Z zeta 2 over cosine zeta 2 minus zeta 1 over cosine theta 1 over the same things with a plus sign. This is what we call the Fresnel reflection coefficient. Rearrange it a little bit by clearing the cosines out of denominators, and that appears as in the uh, notes. But there it is. It was basically one step. You can get the transmission coefficient in a similar way. That is done in the notes. So it's going to be a work saver. It's going to be a significant work saver. And we'll come back to this idea a couple of times during the course. So next time we're going to finish out the chapter talking about non-uniform transmission lines. What happens if instead of having the parameters of the line, say a constant here and a constant here, and they just change discontinuously, what happens if they can vary smoothly? All kinds of new and interesting things happen in that situation. And we're done for today.